Good morning. Today we begin our discussion of the judicial branch of the United States government, and I propose to talk about it in three short segments. Today, we'll say more next time, but today I want to talk about um, the structure of the judiciary. I want, then secondly, I want to talk about how the power of the judiciary has changed and evolved. And then I want to say some things about how we go about appointing members of the judicial branch, judges, and so forth. So let's, let's begin. By the way, I hope you've noticed that I have a haircut, and I'm feeling much lighter. I'm feeling much, much lighter. Next week, I'm going to have new glasses, uh, since these keep falling off my nose and turning to the side all the time. So next week, I'm looking forward to a brand new start and a whole new set of energy and, 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 and accessories that should work to our mutual advantage. If it doesn't work out that way, don't let me know. Anyway, the judiciary. The judiciary, the judicial branch of the government, by which I mean the courts, the Supreme Court, what we call appellate courts, and district courts are a vital portion or a vital segment of our national decision, our national governmental structure. They play a deep and very, very important defining role in deciding who gets what, when, where, and how, and the authoritative allocation of values. This has not come naturally, because at the time of the Constitutional Convention, there was a great deal of, no, there was, first, the, the, at the time of the Constitutional Convention, the role of the judiciary did not loom very large in the minds of the, found, of the, of the founders. The Federalists, generally speaking, thought that there would be a weak judiciary by which they meant a judiciary that confined itself to deciding whose cow was responsible for damaging what field, uh, whose boat rammed what pier, whose, which, well, there weren't railroads, but which canal cut through a farmer's field, those kinds of civil issues and, of course, criminal issues. Did John murder Mary and so on and so forth. The Federalists felt or did not believe that the judiciary should actually make comments or have a role in the way the government worked. In other words, they felt that the, the judiciary would be established, it would take care of the law, it would take care of legal stuff, and that's all that it would do. The Anti-Federalists, on the other hand, who have, had, who have to have been, who have to be the most suspicious people in the world, bless their hearts, felt that there needed to be a vantage point from which the actions of the government as a whole could be viewed in the context of the Constitution. And therefore, they felt that there should be a stronger judiciary. Now, weak and strong in this point, in this case, refer really not so much to powers, but as to focus. The Federalists wanted a system that dealt with all that legal stuff, and they didn't have to worry about it. The Anti-Federalists were much more concerned with having a judiciary that would say something about the constitutionality of acts of government and the constitutionality of what went on. You will understand that this flows naturally from the assumptions we've talked about, about Federalists, and the assumptions about Anti-Federalists. We continue to fight this battle today, by the way. How many times have we heard about the court making law? How many times has Justice Scalia, the late Justice Scalia, talked about we can't have a bunch of unelected people making law or making new statutes. So that does exist to this, to this very day. 
in the event that issue was never really resolved. Frankly, I think the delegates to the convention felt they had other fish to fry. There were other things that were much more important. Slavery, the three-fifths compromise, the you know, bicameralism, all these things that you've written about so, so, so effectively and so brilliantly in your exams and essays. That was not sarcastic. That was meant to be a true statement. So, in other words, the judiciary didn't rise to take a great deal of, 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 of energy and effort from the, uh, among, among the delegates. In any case, in 1789, the Congress passed something called the Judiciary Act of 1789, which established the basic structure of our legal system, of our court system, as it exists to this very day. At the top was a Supreme Court. At the time, I believe it had, it, was, it had five justices. In the middle, so to speak, there was something called an appellate court. It's in your text, A-P-P-E-L-L-A-T-E, -L -L -E, an appellate court, a court of appeals, a court where if, if you didn't like what happened at the lower level, you could, you, you could appeal the decision. And then at the bottom, we had something called district courts, which did the basic work. Now, this is not part of the Constitution, but what the states did was to follow the national model and set up more or less identical structures within each state. So in each state, you'll see a Supreme Court, an appeals court, or an appellate court, and district courts. I hope none of you have had any experience with any of those and that it stays that way. Today, we have 89 districts in 50 states. There are also districts in Puerto Rico, the American Virgin Islands, Washington, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., Guam, and are you ready for this one? The Northern Mariana Islands. Why the Northern Mariana Islands? We don't actually own the Northern Mariana Islands, but that is a trust territory ceded to us by the, with, with the agreement of the United Nations. The reason we like it is because the reason we're there is because along with Hawaii, the Northern Mariana Islands are strategically important in our relationships with Asia. So, the Northern Mariana Islands. All in all, in total, there are 94 districts with 677 judges. 677 judges. That means that the President of the United States gets to a point, 677 judges, because every time there is a new, every time there is, well, that, that's not true, judges are appointed for life. But I guess the point, I, what I'm pointing to here is that judges are a huge source of patronage and therefore power for not just the president who makes the formal application, but the senators who have to approve. If you remember, judges are appointed with advice and consent. No issue has been more strident in our recent history than the appointment of judges. Through the last four administrations, this is precisely what we have, what we have talked about and what has brought the government to a halt at least twice because the sides simply cannot agree on whom to appoint. Now, in addition to these 89 district courts, there's also a court of international trade where if you, know, you think that, how can I put it? If you think that XXX International has cheated you out of something, you can bring them to this court, to the court of international trade. And then, and then, and then there's the court of federal claims. Uh, which is equivalent to a district court, 
if you think the government owes you money and you want to sue the government for back pay, uh, if you think you've overpaid your taxes and the government says you haven't overpaid your taxes, you go to the Court of Federal Claims. We don't hear much about either of these courts, and I think that's the reason is they, they really, they're very specialized and they don't have an awful lot to say. Now, the district courts have original jurisdiction, and I want you please to remember that term. Original jurisdiction refers to that body of things that the court is directly responsible for in the first instance. If you don't pay your taxes, if you avoid or evade income taxes, then the district, the relevant district court in the state where it is located and so on, has original jurisdiction over that particular issue. I couldn't begin to give a list of things of, you know, who has original jurisdiction in what specific case. But generally speaking, the district courts have what we call original jurisdiction in particular in a range of particular issues. If you think you have a beef and you want to go to law, you have to figure out which court has original jurisdiction, which court has the right, so to speak, to make a judgment in your particular case. So we've talked about district courts. Now let's talk about appellate courts. Appellate courts used to be called circuit courts because when the country, back when transportation wasn't quite so good and long before we had Skype and, 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 and teleconferencing and things of that sort, judges had to go travel around and hold sessions at various times. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> hence the term, hence the term circuit court. We still use the term circuit court, but we really mean appellate court. There are 12 regional appellate courts, or circuits. Each appellate court has from three to five judges. You may recall when President Trump's executive order on uh, immigration was issued and it was challenged that there was a judge, a district judge in, in Seattle said it was unconstitutional. It was appealed to the appellate court. And if you were watching TV or if you followed that at all, you'll remember that the, the meeting, the trial, so to speak, actually was a, what's the word, it was a, um, I forget what the word is, in any case, three judges participated in appeals, appellate court judges appeal, <laughs> participated in that. One was in Los Angeles, one was in Seattle, and I don't know where the third one was, and it was a big teleconference, which is what it was. So the original jurisdiction then of the appellate courts is appeals. If you don't like what happens to you in the district court, you can then appeal, take it up to the appellate court. The appellate court doesn't have to take the case if it doesn't feel there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But you have the appellate court. Then at the very top of the pyramid, of course, we have the Supreme Court, which now is up to nine justices. We have a full Supreme Court for the first time in, in quite a while. The Supreme Court is the court of last resort, so to speak. Whatever the Supreme Court says is the law, is the law. The Supreme Court exists to resolve conflicts between, between and among lower courts. If one court, if a court in Alabama says one thing and a court in Montana says another on the same case, 
you go to the Supreme Court and they say, this is the way it is. It resolves conflicts between laws in different states. And it also assures that the application and interpretation of law is consistent within the nation as a whole. That is the original jurisdiction of the, of the, of the, of the Supreme Court. So it's very simple. We have the Supreme Court, we have appellate courts, we have district courts. Judges are nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate, hold their offices for life. And it's all that simple, except it really isn't all that simple, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. 